Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Life and Development Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of life and development that govern the operation of God's laws gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws, and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 5th of November 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, well, welcome to the next uh, part of our discussion, which is, as you can see, life and development principles. Again, we'll be doing a very similar format to what we've just done with with Love and Truth Principles, where we do both principles, one after the other, and straight into the Q&A with with just a minute break in between. And so, got to be on time, otherwise we get this day, we'll get away from me. So let's look at the Life Principles. So life principles transfer God's life force to each creation principle and law. So God has an energy or a force called his life force, which is uh, actually where any living thing gets its life from. And, uh, And so life energy is given from God to living creations. And remember, it's not just creatures. Living things include things like, you know, all, the, all of the plants and right down to the micro size, you know, bacteria, viruses and so forth, right the way up through to the human body, which is the most complex of all of God's physical creations. But then it, on top of that, it's given to the human spirit body, which is the most complex of all of God's spirit-based creations, And then it's also given to the human soul, which is the most complex of all of God's creations. So uh, it it means that life can be experienced by these creatures, but it also means that as humans, we can have a self-existing, self-aware life as well. Without this, we would not have it. It also means, though, that uh, we can transfer life and Creatures and beings are able to transfer life from from itself to another creature or being or or creation. So, for example, most trees have seeds, and life force is pregnant inside of the seed along with its genetic code, and that determines what that seed will become. Once it begins, when the life force is triggered through planting it, putting it in the right environment, what happens with that seed, where it will go, depends very much upon this life force principle being transferred. So it also means that we as humans can transfer some of it, but we can't create the soul. We're only able to create the bodies. So human body is transferred from one couple to a child through the procreation process. So that's all part of this life principles. We've also got that life is promoted, nurtured and respected and sustained. We'll see how that applies in some of the examples when we come to that. And imbalance is prevented and repaired. So you see this a lot where man has degraded the environment. Even in extreme cases where man has degraded the environment, if the environment is left alone, not not touched by humans after that point, slowly you see some repair processes begin. And depending on the extreme amount of degradation that's occurred, depends on how slow that process begins. But eventually it recovers itself, eventually. It might take hundreds, even thousands of years to recover some parts of it. And if man leaves things alone, everything gets back to, eventually, a pristine condition. That was all part of the life principle. And matter that dies is transformed. And I put the word dies in quotation because 
the reality is there's life is pregnant in everything, even in the smallest particles. So, so there is life in all sorts of things. But, but what it appears to die, what happens is it's transformed and it basically is deconstructed and then so that it back to its basic constituent elements so that those elements can be used in another creation uh, and therefore support life. And so this is what I said earlier, how houses that we build are, are a primary target for God's creatures to degrade back into something that's usable from their perspective. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, well, this is because of this principle, actually, that that is ensured. It's a very simple principle, isn't it, to understand, really? Of course, it's very complicated. One of the most difficult things to, uh, to understand is how life actually works. It's one of those things that humans have pondered for well, the entire time humans have existed, and we still haven't really found the answer, even even in the spirit world, still haven't really found the answer. How that actually works. I'm sure in the future, we'll, somebody will discover the answer, but, but it still hasn't really been discovered at this point. Even, even the very highest spirit in the spirit world doesn't know. Interesting. So let's look at some examples. Gravity, let's look at an example of gravity. We talked about gravity, so we, we've said how we've got the circle, of the Earth, we've got its circumference as 4,075 kilometres, and it's spinning around at 1,670 k's per hour, right? <coughs> spinning, spinning, spinning. Now, under those circumstances, if there was no gravity, the atmosphere and everything on the Earth would just fly off of it. Therefore, the Earth would look more like Venus or one of those planets where it had nothing; it'd be just just matter. That, that doesn't is not pregnant with life at all. So the fact that gravity creates the atmosphere, pulls in all of the things, prevents creatures from flying off into outer space, means that gravity supports the life principle. Which is quite simple, isn't it? To see as, as an example. It's interesting how you can grab a law like gravity and see how each principle is actually involved in the law if you start analysing, isn't it? So it's not like God isn't trying to show us things, right? It's just that we're not very observant or reflective. So we've talked about this before, the whole centrif centrifugal force being a problem I under normal circumstances without gravity, without mass creating gravity, there would be all these problems with centrifugal forces. We were travelling at 1,670 kilometres an hour, which is faster than the speed of sound, actually. But it's, a, but it's a relative, it's a relative travelling, isn't it? We're, we're not travelling as compared to the Earth's surface. But it's interesting with the atmosphere, the atmosphere actually provides also the ability for us to travel at that speed without anything happening to us, as long with, and the atmosphere is created by, in, and along with other things, but gravity is part of creation of that atmosphere. Yep. Let's look at aerodynamics. The beautiful thing about aerodynamics, you can't engage the law unless you know it. Huh? Isn't that great? Because if you could accidentally engage it without knowing it, imagine the disaster. You'd be like, oh, I'm flying, I'm flying, what do I do? <laughs> oh, man, you know, you crash into things and before you know it, you'd, 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 you'd be splattered all over the, <laughs> the ground at some point because you didn't know how to control it, right? So. So it requires knowledge, whether that's instinctual or obtained by investigation from a human's perspective, it's investigative. From, a, from an animal's perspective or an or, or insect's perspective, it's instinctual. But it requires knowledge in order to be engaged and therefore it prevents accidental engagement of the law. Right? So it promotes life. Not being able to accidentally engage a law means that you your life is sustained. So imagine all of a sudden somebody come along and said, this is how the law of teleportation works. You go, you beauty, I want to be in that. And, you say, and then you go bang and then you teleported yourself to outer space. <laughs> 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 
no atmosphere, it's freezing cold, instantly frozen, and that's the end of your life. <laughs> your very first experiment with the law. So, so, so you can see that, you know, obviously you need to know a law, one of these higher laws, in order to engage it, and that actually promotes your life. It means you survive longer. Yeah. So that's great, eh? Is it great? <laughs> Let's look at the compensation. The compensation laws and the compensation principle, actually, which governs the compensation laws, prevents the degradation of a soul to the point that the soul cannot sustain its own life. So in other words, there's, there's nothing you can do, no matter how bad you get, no matter how unloving you get, no matter how evil you get, no matter how violent you get, no matter how terrible you get as an individual, there's nothing you can do that is actually going to destroy your soul. Because the compensation principles prevent you from going into such degradation that you can't sustain your life anymore. That's pretty good, isn't it? So it's an amazing creation, really. It means that you, you're not able to do anything to destroy yourself. So can you see straight away why suicide would be an issue with regard to this law? Because you're, you're actually trying to destroy yourself and you can't. You know, and God's laws are preventing you from doing so. So there must be, you know, there's obviously things that operate emotionally there. If, you, if you're desiring suicide, there must be a reason that needs to be addressed. And, and this is what most people who suicide find out. They suicide and they're still alive still frustrated by exactly the same cause that caused them the suicide in the first place. Which forces them to address the reason why they suicide rather than trying to attempt to harm themselves anymore. And that in itself is, uh, this law prevents them from suiciding, actually, in, in a real sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's wonderful too. If you look at the Earth systems, um, they, they are constantly working to repair or right themselves, aren't they? Right? I don't know if, uh, like, I've, I've noticed that if, you, if humans leave a portion of the earth alone to recover, it eventually recovers. Right? But, but if we're on it, trying to so called assist it to recover, often we're assisting its degradation. So, so that often doesn't work very well. And, or if we're on it, still utilising the um, resources that are available in that area that needs recovery, then obviously recovery is going to take a very, very long time. But the Earth is working towards recovery. It's working to create and fix the imbalances that have been created. Even though we created them, God created the Earth in such a way that it's trying to recover the imbalances that even his highest creation created. Uh, so as the highest creation, we created a heap of imbalances and God is still going, no, I want, I want it to be back how it was. So I've created all these mechanisms that eventually are going to get back there <laughs> sooner or later. Right? Now, of course, even if the earth itself was nuked completely and, and no human life or even other life could be sustained, there would still be things that could live in that environment, which would have then eventually recover the environment. Very hard for a human um, to actually destroy the, his living environment, which is great, really, isn't it? Because <laughs> it means, means that you know, we can't accidentally destroy our environment. It has to be a purposeful act, really, to destroy environments. Yeah, because the Earth is always trying to repair and regain equilibrium. And what I like, too, about it is it, it even does it under extreme pressure. Like, for most of you, your bodies, you don't realise it yet, but your bodies are under extreme stress. Extreme stress, particularly from the emotion of fear, which causes extreme stresses in your body. And yet you're still standing up, still functioning, still able to eat, still able to, you know, relative, have relative enjoyment of your life, even under this extreme pressure that you're placing upon your body systems. Right? So it's very clever that God's designed this into everything, this life principle. So if we examine more of the body, 
It has millions of inbuilt automatic detoxifying and eliminating systems that are self-correcting, trying to get you to back to your pristine still. It even works so much that, that every seven years, unless you interfere with the process with your emotions, every seven years, every cell in your body gets replaced. So let's try it there a little bit. Might not work soon. Put in another bit. Throw out that bit, put in another bit, and that's happening constantly, constantly. And the only reason why that stops is because we stop it through our emotional condition, through our fear, in fact. We stop it. Fear of death being a primary reason why it stops. Right? So here we are, we, we have all these inbuilt systems that are helping sustain our longevity, our life. So, so you know... At the moment, you could say by the time we're 70 or 80 or 90, we're really still a child, right? We still don't know very much generally at that age. And in fact, it seems like some people know less than they did when they began sometimes at that age. But, but the reality is that, that God has created this ability for you to live a lot longer than that if you don't interfere with the system. And if you lived a lot longer than that on earth, you imagine you'd be able to learn a lot more, wouldn't you? and therefore know more before you passed, and therefore feel much more comfortable as you pass. Right? But because we're unfortunately doing all of these damaging things to our body, even with all these damaging things, we still live now 70 or 80 years, but, or maybe a bit longer, but, but unfortunately, because of the damage, we're not uh, able to keep this body of ours doing what it's naturally designed to do, and so it dies, but even when we die, we're still alive. <laughs> How remarkable is that? So life is transformed or transferred now, and it's not, and it's always been there. But our primary source of interface with the universe around us becomes our spirit body now. What a design! If we stuff up our physical body so badly that we die, our spirit body takes over, and that's how we interface with the world around us then until such a time as we are in a union state with our mate. And isn't that wonderful? It's like, that might take 10,000 years, so 10,000 years, that body's going to be useful. Might take 100,000 years, so 100,000 years. Oh, I've got some friends that's taken more than 100,000 years. And the body's been good to them the whole time. <laughs> it's so good, isn't it? And again, like even under severe hardship or emotional, physical strain, it's amazing what the body does. It's just amazing. You can even cut off limbs and all sorts of things and life sustained, you know. It's like incredible if you know how to do it, of course. Of course, I don't recommend it. <clears throat> so the life principles allow it or any creation to receive God's life force and then to be able to supply that life through, through its own procreative abilities. All right? And the life principles ensure that life remains sacred and that all mechanisms are created to support and sustain life. Yeah. So you can see then that we as humans frequently justify, minimise and shift to blame and do all the other things we do, avoiding emotions and actions and thoughts that, that oppose life principles. So you can see war is actually a direct opposition to a life principle. You see that? It's quite... Abortion, another one, com completely opposing life principles. Our health care, so-called. We think we're promoting our life and often we're putting drugs and other things into our body that actually are destroying the body's natural desire to create some balance. And we're often doing that. But in particular, emotions are destroying our body's ability to maintain balance. And we hold on to them. We don't let them go because we're a bit frightened of them, right? There's pollution, eating meat, fear of emotions, fear of death. All these things are creating imbalances that oppose the life principle. Hmm. So that's our life principles. Pretty, pretty simple? Yeah. But, as I said, there's some things in this principle that we, the most developed person who's ever existed on the, on the planet, who now exists in the spirit world, still doesn't know anything about. Isn't that amazing? Like you can, you can get so close to God and yet you still don't know anything about some basic things. 
just shows you how complicated those things must be, doesn't it, really? How well designed and intricate they actually are. Something we take for granted. And, you know, whenever we abort a child, obviously that's really taking it for granted, isn't it? If we shoot somebody or we hurt somebody, uh, kill somebody, we're really taking this principle for granted there. And you can see why that then becomes quite a severe sin from God's perspective. Because it's a direct opposition to this principle. Hmm. Okay, well, let's go to the development principles. Now, we've put these two principles together because they are in some ways sort of interwoven with each other again. It's like the truth and love principles are so connected and interwoven with each other and life and development is so interwoven with each other as well because it's not enough from God's perspective that you have life. He wants you to not only have life but for your life to grow and develop. <coughs> and if you think about it, if you were just given life with no opportunity for change, for growth, or degradation for that matter, no opportunity at all, how, how would life be? You'd feel quite controlled, would you not? Where, where you don't have any self-determination. So God has added to the life principles, the development principles, to give you self-determination. But it's not only you that has self-determination. God's also added self-determination to almost all of God's creations. So let's have a look at the development principles. They allow each creation, principle and law to evolve, to grow and change positively. And we could also say they allow for the degradation, the degradation, the devolvement as well. But the primary reason for their creation was the positive evolvement and growth and change of all creation. So what this means is that expansive change is really forced upon everything in all matter. Everything wants to combine to get the bigger thing done. So even the very smallest particles want to combine to form larger elements. Yeah. And that everything is it's built in as a natural occurrence, like an instinctual process, an instinctual pattern. Its growth is supported and encouraged and is sustained. So, so as we've seen, just like life is supported, so too growth is supported. Right? And just like life is sustained as, well, as much as possible, so too growth is sustained as much as possible. You notice there's nothing that sort of goes to a certain size and then just stops. Right? Things we do generally do that, but... But most things don't do that. If even the human body doesn't do that, believe it or not, the human body is constantly in a state of change. Right? Now, unfortunately, for most of us, it is in a state of devolvement. As we get older, we're holding on to more emotions. That affects the natural process. And so the replication process of the cells can't be sustained. And as a result of that, our, you know, we start getting more wrinkles, we start getting grey hair and so forth. Right? That's a natural part of our opposition to the life and development principles. But if we're in full harmony with those principles, we'll grow younger again and we'll be around 25 years of age. But that doesn't mean you're not changing. You'll look about 25, but every single cell in your body in seven years' time is going to be completely different than the ones that are in your body right now. Your whole body's changed in that time. And that gives you an opportunity for your soul to develop and therefore change and therefore your spirit body to develop and change through that process. So it's all supporting growth. Positive development and evolution occurs for all matter. As I said, it's right down to the very smallest particle right up to the God's largest creation is affected by this principle. Every single law is affected by this principle. Yep. And increasing capacities can develop. So what that means is that you might at this stage be in a certain state and you have a certain state of growth, but you can't do certain things. Now, it's a very simple illustration, but you think of a baby comparison to a toddler. 
and a toddler in comparison to a teenager and a teenager in comparison to an adult. You can see that as the growth is happening, there are growing capacities that weren't there pre previously inside that being as it changes. Does that make sense? So there it's growing, changing. Okay, so self-determination also of the human soul is now possible because we're now saying with the human soul that development is cap you're capable of developing because of choices that you make. So now you are determining your growth and development. Right? And this, without the development principle, God wouldn't have probably done that. God would have just allowed you, created you as you are, and that's it. That's, a, that's what you're going to be the rest of your existence. Development principles stop that from occurring. So let's look at some examples. Again, we look at the gravity. Because my situation with gravity means that my life on Earth is sustained, I have a certain period of time on Earth, unless I engage some other laws that cause accidents or whatever, I have a certain period of time on Earth that my life can be sustained. Now I have the potential to develop. So, so I'm born as a little baby. How, how long were you when you were a child? I think I was like, I don't know, I can't remember the exact measurements, but I was eight pounds something. You know, most of us are... Some of us, I've seen a little child that was only like a few ounces actually, but, but generally most of us are in the pounds when we're born. And yet, boom, 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 boom. We grow to a state where we can crawl and then walk and then stand, you know, stand and interact. And our brain during that process is growing in its capacity to understand the world around it. Right? Our emotions are growing, we, start, we express emotion, we start to understand emotion, we start to connect with emotion and desire, that all starts growing, will grows, everything starts growing because my life is sustained. Now, if gravity didn't exist, as we've mentioned, our life wouldn't be sustained and none of that would be possible. So even gravity itself sustains the development principle, it allows our development as a, in, in the human body form, the physical body form. Just a simple law. Aerodynamics, what does it do with that? Well, the knowledge of the law allows enhanced forms of travel and experiences. So that's growth and development, isn't it? I, now I can move around better. I can go places I couldn't go before. See things I didn't see before. Experience things that I couldn't experience before. All because of that law. So the law is sustaining my ability to develop, my ability to experience new things. Right? If we examine some of the other examples in the human body, quite obvious, right? Sperm and egg get together. At, at, at one point, they're just two single cells get together, and then what do they do? Miraculously, split, 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 split. And not only do they split, but they split via an inbuilt law-based genetic code that determines the outcome that came from just those two individual single cells and their commingling. What a remarkable little process, isn't it? But dem it demonstrates that God wants us to develop, starting out small things. In fact, in the human form, you, you can't with your naked eye see those cells. Right? You can't even see them. And yet, look what you've grown into. So something that was invisible to you, uh, would have been invisible to you at your, in, your conception, now you're a visible person standing you know, five or six feet tall or whatever, being able to express yourself and, and share your life and share in other people's lives, all because of that one thing. Remarkable. Let's look at compensation. The law encourages me when I'm out of harmony with the law to get into harmony with the law by encouraging me to develop and change. So the law is basically saying, if you're out of harmony, in other words, you're out of harmony with love, and if you're out of harmony, the law of compensation is going to help you to get back into harmony. 
So even if God didn't help you, he's already created a whole heap of laws that will help you. That's remarkable too, isn't it? Fancy planning that. <laughs> Sometimes it amazes me even now, like, like I said, I've studied these things for thousands of years and I'm still amazed by it at all. Like, amazed that somebody had, had that much intelligence and wisdom to even create a system like that. It's, re it's remarkable. Like, it just amazes me completely. So look at the universe. The whole universe supports positive and negative development. In other words, you can degrade in the universe or you can progress in the earth, but it supports and encourages positive development only. In other words, it allows negative development, allows degradation, but it doesn't support it. All right? It only supports positive growth. It doesn't allow... It only allows negative, based on the choices of the human, of course, because we're the only free will being. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay, transformation of the human soul. Principle of development supports your complete transformation. Without the principle of development, you cannot turn into a divine creature. So even that is controlled by this principle, along with some others. So there's the development principle. So what do they do? They allow any creation to develop and change by ensuring that the mechanisms for change and adaptation exist within the creation itself and also exist in the creation's environment. So inbuilt inside of your body are the mechanisms to allow for evolution. Inbuilt in, outside of your body are the mechanisms that allow your body to engage the principles of evolution and change. So there's an interaction between external laws and internal laws. There's rule sets, you could call them rule sets, which are just groups of laws that govern how your body functions and how the external law functions and the interplay between those two things that allow for your development. Amazing principle. How do we oppose them? Well, like I, one of the ones that really comes up for me when I think about that is how much do families stop other family members from changing? Man, it's, we're bad with that, aren't we? It's like one just, you know, get a, try getting a different religion to your family. Try that and see how you go with that. There's many people who have been murdered for that. Many people have been murdered for that. Try just having an opinion that your mum and dad weren't too loving and see how you go with that. Man, mum and dad just go ballistic at that one. Right? Just ho holding on, having a different opinion, which has nothing to do with safety or security of that person, really, but just having a different opinion than somebody else and try that and how much you get attacked and abused and belittled and you know all those things for that. That shows you how much we oppose development and change. It's sad, really, isn't it, that it happens like that? Just very sad, I find. But you know, another one I think of is child rearing. Yeah, man, what a mess we've made of that. Man, it's just terrible. We, we basically believe that we own the child. They're our child. We call them our child, my child, my son, my daughter. Right? Why do we call them that? Because we believe we own them, really. Right? Whose child are they? They're not ours, they're God's. But we want to say they're ours because we created the body they live in. And, and was it very hard to create the body they live in? No, not very hard. Because God designed the whole thing for us and all we had to do is do a bit of things <laughs> and, and it was done. Right? It wasn't hard, was it? And, and yet we go, look what I've created. <laughs> as if. As if. <coughs> as if. And then, and then not only do we say, look what I've created, I go in because I created you, I can force you to do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. That's what we believe. You know, it's hard to find a parent who doesn't believe that. 
right? Man, we've stuffed it up good and proper, child-wearing. Terrible thing we've done. Out of harmony with the development principle. All of that, out of harmony with the development principle. So, so you can see again that, you know, these are areas where we just sin and sin again and sin again and sin again and sin again. You know, it's like, uh, can you see why some people in the spirit world have a long list in front of them of all their sins? Because it's quite easy to sin against these principles if we don't have the right attitudes and the right emotional condition. Yeah. So that, you know, to me, these are problems that we face in our day-to-day -day life, emotional issues we face where we're not accepting these principles. Mm. Okay, well now we come to the Q&A on the subject. So I'll just, uh, we'll just do a quick transformation of, uh, for Lena and myself and we'll get some of those questions. Mary's got the list for me that I'll just browse over. All right, so we're at the Life and Development Principles Q&A. The first thing we're going to discuss are the Life Principles. So, Patty, could we have a mic down with Patty and Inga? Where's Inga? Yes, we have a mic with Inga. If you leave your hand up, Inga, so that someone can see you. Okay, Patty, um, you remember your question? You've got it written down? Uh, yes, I think you answered it already very clearly. I have, but I would like to further elucidate, <laughs> okay? right. so you, you can ask the question even though. Um, so does life, as in the definition, include life in the spirit body, and does it include life in the soul after soul union? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because it, actually it's a pretty complex life in our physical form, and for the human in particular, it's very, very complex. It actually, if we examine it more, clear, more clear, clearly, you'll see that, remember I've talked about to your soul in its, in its completed state, which is like that. Now, I'm not assuming this is a union-based soul, of course. Remember, there's just from our, from our second group, you learned that it was the illusion of separation between the two halves. As you, when you incarnate, you've obviously got the creation of the physical and spiritual bodies, uh, spirit body there and the physical body and, and obviously if it's a female yeah, it would be like so okay remember we've talked about the cord the silver cord that connects these bodies right and uh, sort of this connection you could call it like a golden cord an energy cord it is in fact yes so so for the human form to to in order for the human form to exist in its completed state. When mum and dad, you know, have sex and, and, the, and the conception occurs, if a soul is not incarnated into those body, into those, in, uh, to connect to those bodies, then interestingly enough, the life that's given by the parent to those bodies cannot be sustained. So what happens is the soul eventually takes over, if you like, providing the life to those bodies through these cords, through these energy pathways. So, so the actual life principle applies to the human soul and then as a byproduct through the ways the soul is connected to the bodies, to the bodies. You follow? Um, I lost a bit, sorry. So the life principle comes to the soul. Yeah. The soul provides life to maintain these bodies ah, okay. you follow yeah. and this is why this is why the degradation of the physical body occurs as you have emotional injuries in this soul its ability to transform to to transfer energy to the bodies is degraded the first degradation occurs in the spirit body. So that's in pretty much an instant degradation. As soon as the soul has a limitation placed upon it because of the limitation of your emotions, that, that limitation causes a destruction of certain pathways supplying energy to the spirit body. The spirit body now degrades in its condition. So it gets wrinkly and look, starts looking old. Does that make sense? And because the... The, the soul is supplying also the physical body's energy through the connection between the two bodies, the silver cord, this body also stops receiving energy. 
So therefore this body starts degrading. But this body takes a bit longer because it's slower. Right? It takes a bit longer to degrade. Because remember there's the cell replication process that is a part of its degradation. Whereas the spirit body's cell replication process happens in hours. Does that make sense? Yes. So physically there's laws that dictate the cell replication process in the spirit body and there's laws that dictate the cell replication process in the spirit in the physical body. Mm -hmm. The cell replication in the process in the spirit in the physical body is normally around the 7 year period for most of the cells whereas in the spirit body the period is less than 7 hours. Right? So you get so if your soul condition in the spirit world improves your spirit body usually within seven hours, also improves. But if your soul condition in your soul degrades, your spirit body within seven hours will degrade. Right? But your physical body will take up to seven years to degrade mm -hmm. for the same, from the same issue. Does that make sense? But it's all supplied through energy coming from the soul and the life force is provided through the soul to those bodies. And in fact, if a soul didn't connect to those bodies, then those bodies would naturally die in the womb. Does that make sense? That'd be yeah. miscarriage. It'd be not a miscarriage, because a miscarriage is after the soul has connected. It would be, they, they wouldn't even be able to replicate yeah. after that per point. Because they're getting energy from the soul to replicate. Does that make sense? It does. May yeah. I ask a follow-up? Sure, you can. So I'd been wondering whether aging and the effects of sin were a, a, a wearing away of life energy, but that's not true. It's a wearing away of the flow, the connection. It's a wearing away of the soul's ability to receive and transmit life energy to its bodies, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's degraded. it's degraded condition means that energy cannot flow. If energy cannot flow, there will be a subsequent degradation in the bodies to which the energy would normally flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Pretty fascinating how it all works. But, but the reality is it's all based upon the fact that you can see the power of your emotions again, the power of your condition out of harmony with love, affecting the flow of energy. Remember, all of God's energies are based upon the love and truth principles. So whenever you're out of harmony with truth or out of harmony with love, there's a restriction to that flow of that energy, naturally. And the subsequent restriction causes a subsequent result, which is a degradation of the bodies to which the energy should be flowing, but is no longer flowing. Yeah. So there are people in the spirit world who have passed on earth, they, they you know, were quite damaged emotionally with regard to love, and they, they ch made a lot of choices out of harmony with love, and as a result, they degraded their own condition in their soul, which means that the flow of energy is almost stopped completely. And many of those can't even maintain their own body and keep their body together anymore. So they actually have parts of their body that are disjointed and in different places. What, what you would classify as deformed, what you see as a deformation, can actually occur in the spirit body. And there are many people who have passed and still who live in the spirit world who have serious deformations of their spirit body. So don't think that all of your deformations of your physical body will disappear once you hit the spirit world because it depends upon your condition as to whether that will happen or not. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Thank you. Now, you also asked a question about the soul after union. Well, the soul after union is very interesting because the soul after union can cycle its now cycle its energy between both halves of the soul. Whereas before then, the soul before union is not conscious of this union, so therefore only cycles energy to its bodies. But once it's conscious of union, it's now got the ability to cycle energy within the soul itself. Now, this has a multiplying effect within the soul, therefore an exponential effect in terms of what it can create. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. And that's why soul union is important to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And removing any of the reasons why you can't uh, enter that state is important to you. So that's why in soul union you can 
for many bodies, many physical bodies. Yes, and sustain their energy for an infinite yes. amount of time. Yes. 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 That makes sense? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> because you have the ability to receive more and more of that energy and therefore distribute more of that energy and therefore actually create physical and spiritual forms that you can sustain through your own creation, through your energy that's passing through you. So the capacity of your soul increases as a result. That makes sense? Yeah. Hmm. Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. 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 So, you know, we talk about a soul union, but there's a whole heap of mathematical things going on and a whole heap of law-based principles working to make that happen. Of course. Hmm. But I thought I just wanted to extend that understanding because it's a fascinating area of discussion, really. You can see how, you know, the energy of the bodies is very dependent upon the energy flowing through the soul now. And there are cre the, the same applies to other creatures, but not in the same way. For, for example, a dog or a cat, energy is supplied directly from God to the spirit body, and then the spirit body supplies energy to the physical body. And it's only if the spirit body can no longer supply that energy to the physical body that the dog body dies. Right? Now, that is also determined by the human condition because of the issues of governance. So we'll learn later that governance allows the human to control what happens to other energy life forms and what happens with the flow of energy in those life forms. Right? So the human soul is a very remarkable creation. It has the ability to control through its condition and through its designs, has the ability to control other life forms and what happens with other life forms. Yeah. Powerful stuff, eh? Very clever. This clever God, see? <laughs> Pretty clever. Inga. Yes, I think you already answered my question, almost. I think I have, but, yeah. but, but uh, 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 ask the anyway? question anyway, and we'll okay. just elucidate again. Uh, is the life energy one and the same for all living creatures? Yes. So there's yes. the answer to that, uh, yes. And does it enter the soul for the human being and the spirit body for the animals? How does it all work? Yes, it does enter the soul of the human being and the spirit body of the animals. I, I won't describe how it works because ah, it's a okay. bit complicated. But, um, yeah, it, it does enter those, uh, the soul of the human. So there are, in fact, it's best for you to understand that there are, in fact, many types of energy. Um, some of them, are, one's a life force energy, but there are energies like, for example, the human soul is capable of supplying enough energy to the bodies that mean the bodies don't have to absorb uh, nutrients from food because they can absorb nutrients from the environment through, the, through what the soul feeds them. So you can get to the point where you don't need to eat anymore. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, you might still eat because it, sometimes it's tasty, right? And, mm. and you, you might want that, but, but you don't need to anymore. And you can also get to the stage where you don't need to drink anymore as well because the human body receives the flow of water through its body and supplies that to the energy systems in the physical and spiritual bodies. You can do that as well. But, you know, again, that takes a bit of development to get to that stage. Now... There's people on earth who have done it in the past, but only because they've been assisted to by spirits. They haven't done it on their own, through the use of their own body. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. And you. the third question you had was, does it enter the soul for the human being and the spirit body for the animals, and how does it work? Well, yeah, how it works, very mathematically defined, of course, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, there are a multitude of energies that God supplies to his entire universe. The life force energy is a specific kind of energy in that it, it, it's the thing that provides life itself. But there are also energies that provide sustenance, what you would classify as survival sustenance. In other words, the same thing that you get from food can come through that en energy force. And there are other forms of energy, as you can imagine. Um, how many forms of energy are there potentially? Infinite. An infinite amount. So, so you can imagine an infinite being. There's probably the forms of energy that we're yet to even discover that could be flowing through the human soul. But as yet, because we've yet to discover it, at the moment they can't. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
but they are and might be available for us in the future to discover and then allow the flow of. So we need to stop seeing God as a very limited being, creating a very limited system. We need to start seeing the principle of infinity and how that is implicated in creation and law. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Um, uh, Shula, where's Shula? Where are you? Yep, thank you. How am I going time? I just checked my time, Shula. Two, ten, fifty-three. We've got Q and A, and I've got. Mm, this will be our last question on the subject. So we need to move. Um, does God's life energy enter us at conception, or is it transferred or passed down from our parents? Yeah, the reality is, as you can see from this diagram, that the God's life energy actually enters your soul at the time God created your soul. Mm which may be many millions of years before your bodies are created, wow. <laughs> right? Mm. Many millions of years, you're just not aware of how long that time may be. So because you're living in a state of unawareness in that state, you are not aware that you've already been created. It's through the, the incarnation process is what makes you self-aware. It's part of the process making you self-aware. But the reality is that God supplies this life force energy to the soul while it exists in, you could say, a unconscious union condition. And so God's supplying its energy, just waiting for the chance to incarnate. And the chance to incarnate is created by whom? By, yeah, by the human procreative process that offers the chance to incarnate. And then the law... Of the laws involving incarnation allow for that incarnation to take place. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. So God is actually supplying this energy way before you were ever conscious of it being supplied. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, well, let's look at the development principles now. So I'll just skip over the life principles thing. Yeah, let's just let me get through there. Maybe I should jump. So now we're on development principles Q&A. And remember that was all about this expansive change being forced upon all matter and so forth. Remember that? So let's get started on that. Uh, Yes, uh, Deidre, another good question. So let's go for yourself. If we have one down there. And uh, Julie, where are you? Julie, there you are. Could I have uh, your question? Do you remember it? Well, I don't know if I've fully answered it, but oh. do you want to ask it again? Uh, not now. About. I'll do it with Deidre first. Yeah, it's about... about uh, the laws being constantly created. No? I'll, I'll read your question. Yes. Yep. Deidre. I had many questions. Which one? You did. Um, uh, I'm asking, you wanted to ask one about with the development principle and objectives to allow life to adapt to harmful environments. Oh, yes. Yeah, I've got it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. With the development principle objective to allow life to do, adapt to harmful environments created by the humans... Why does the cockroach survive just about anything, including a nuclear fallout? And does this mean that cockroaches are super important, far more than we realise repairing life on Earth? A very good question. Every single one of God's creations are super important, <laughs> including the cockroach and the mosquito and every other thing we try to get rid of. <laughs> they have reasons for existing, otherwise God would not have created them. You follow? Uh, why, why would God do something that's unnecessary? Of course God doesn't do that. God's economical. He always does things that are necessary. So, so one of the beauty... Let's look at the cockroach as an example. The cockroach is an interesting creature because it, it allows for humankind to, to degrade an environment and it's a part of the recovery process of that degraded environment. So it allows for some, some of the worst decisions for humans to make 
and then for the environment to, be get, to become recovered from those decisions that we've made. So this is God knowing that the human has been given this power, this awesome power of having effect over and governance over other creatures. God has inbuilt in other creatures this ability to survive whatever humans may throw at it. Which is the reason why pesticides are a pointless idea. Because God's actually created creatures to adapt and, and evolve from whatever we can throw at it in order for life to be sustained and continued and development to continue to occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you know this whole industry that develops pesticides, they'd be far better off using all of their knowledge to develop something else, <laughs> something that might sustain that process rather than destroy that process or attempt to. And our attitudes towards cockroaches is terrible. Well, our attitudes towards most things is terrible. Yeah. Like, you know, most people eat, eat animals of any kind, so the reality is our attitude towards anything other than ourselves and even our attitudes towards other humans is terrible. So I don't know if you could say that that's a unique thing <laughs> with regard to any creature. Does that make sense? But it is an interesting question, and basically what it is is the life and development principles are inbuilt in the creatures so that they can sustain the environment enough for us to be able to survive in it, ironically. So, so this is a beautiful thing God has done too. We destroy the environment, but God's created all the bits and pieces of the environment to be able to sustain themselves through our, our self-destructive tendencies and then on top of that to recover it back to some kind of place where we can actually survive. So how much do you think God cares about you doing all that? It kind of blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's quite incredible, isn't it? Very interesting, some of these things, aren't they? Now, Julie, you were going to ask, you were asking the question, are these new laws, which are constantly being created, the work of God? Um, not always. Now, new laws can be created because you, as a, as a creature that's capable of creation, put together two different substances that have never been amalgamated before. And as a result, a new set of laws and a new creature or a new substance is created. And you can do that. God's I've given you the ability. But you could say that God created the ability for that to happen, the perspective of that happening, the future of that being a potential is what God created. Does that make sense? It does. Because what I was talking about with that was what Deidre was talking about, the yep. degradation of our soul yep. and what the consequences are yes. with the life force regarding... Yes, so we, yeah. we obviously have a lot of choices we're making at any point in time. Some of those choices result in new creations, yeah. sin being one of them. Yes. Right? But also we can do a lot of things that create positive things that actually will continue to survive because they're in harmony with God's laws. So in the celestial kingdom, that's what happens. New things are created. So you ha will have the ability to create new things and those things will survive. They won't, they won't be in opposition to God's laws, so therefore they will survive. Yes. And you'll have authority over them. Yes. Mm. And I wanted to find out with the life force... Is it withdrawn from our soul? But it's given to us, but then... Well, this is a point of interesting discussion because nobody has had yet had the life force with removed from their soul. But that doesn't mean that it's not possible. The reason, and, and this becomes a subject of fascinating discussion about the issue of immortality. Right? So there are six fear spirits who spend the whole of their existence just philosophizing about immortality and what's going to happen because they understand that change is a constant thing and if they're not changing, then what's going to happen to their soul? They don't know, you see. And the reality is it is unknown what's going to happen in, those, in that regard. So uh, that question really cannot be answered at this stage. Um, obviously, a soul that receives God's love yes. cannot die and therefore would never have life force energy removed from it. Mm. But it is not known whether the other souls can or cannot die. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. It's, uh, it's something that is of a large amount of importance to many, many 
six fear spirits. In fact, in the six fear, there are institutions devoted to the discovery of the answer of that question. Just like on Earth, we have institutions for scientific discoveries. That is a huge institution in the six fear. But none of it leads to God. Do you know all of this? No, that's right. They're still trying to find a way to survive without God being that's involved. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the irony. And the fact is that we can't survive without yeah. God being involved in the long run. And so this is one reason why they spend a lot of time at it because at the end of the day there is this underlying feeling <laughs> they have that maybe there is the potential of the human soul having life force removed. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for your time there, guys. That's our life and development principles, interesting principles, yes? Yeah, like all of them. And um, if we have a break now and we come back about uh, ten, 10 minutes' time, which is 15 15 13, if we come back about 12 minutes past three, yep, that'll be great. Thank you.